with the first main topic, performance issues and optimization. For system configuration, first thing, always if you're going into a production environment, always install SQL Server on a separate machine. And always a 64-bit system instead of a 32-bit system. Um, next, there are some um, default configurations that the SQL Server is going to set up for you, but they are not necessarily the best. And in most, like 90% of the cases, you will most likely have to change them. I just chose three here to talk a bit about, but there are more. Just uh, the max server memory. By default, the SQL Server is going to is going to be installed with the max server memory value as the 32-bit integer value, like the maximum 32-bit integer value, which is like I don't even know, two billion, two hundred billion, I don't know, bit. Which means that even if you have SQL installed on one machine and just that, just the SQL it's most likely going to take, by default, all of your memory. Which is not a best practice because you would need the OS behind the SQL Server to have a little space to breathe and everything. So, um, you should change the max server memory. For example, if you've got a 64 gigabyte physical memory on a machine, Install max, uh, set max server memory at around 54 gigabytes and leave around 8 gigabytes for the OS to work with. Otherwise, you're going to have some issues. Next, uh, the parallelism. Parallelism in SQL is basically um, Parallelism SQL basically helps the query out, uh, through output in order to create the best execution plans to work on different, di different threads. Now, the cost threshold for parallelism tells the, the SQL optimizer which queries to choose, which queries to take, and try to do a parallel plan. Now, the cost threshold for parallelism is by default 5 which means that the SQL optimizer is going to take queries that are on small tables, that do not take a lot of resources, and try to create parallel plans for them. Which is not a best performance for you because, for the system, because it's going to it's going to do basically extra work for queries that do not need it. So you should set up the cost threshold for parallelism between 20 or even 50 because uh, like this you are basically obligating the SQL optimizer to only create parallel plans, execution plans, for the queries that actually do need it. Queries on large data sets, queries that require a lot of resources and all that. Uh, maybe you should translate that because the transactional log is also. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. Okay. Có một số quy tắc về chuyện optimization mà chúng ta nên lưu ý chút là thứ nhất, SQL Server chúng ta không nên thứ nhất là phải được cài đặt trên một cái máy riêng để chúng ta có một cái environment làm việc tốt nhất, không để bị dây vào các thiết bị khác. Thứ thứ hai thì chúng ta không sử dụng để điều hành, chúng ta không sử dụng bằng hai bit tôi là đến 64 bởi vì lý do là cái số maximum server memory sẽ được lệ thuộc lệ thuộc vào câu chuyện là 32 bit hay 64 bit à, cái thứ hai max server memory của chúng ta chúng ta không bao giờ nên để tối đa max server memory và ngang với cả cái lượng memory mà chúng ta đang có bởi vì kiểu gì thì kiểu chúng ta cũng vẫn cần phải có đất của bộ nhớ cho hệ điều hành cho OS nó còn làm việc cho nên là ví dụ thường nếu chúng ta có 64 mươi gram thì chúng ta nên chỉ để tối đa cái bộ memory cho server là khoảng 56 mươi sáu gram để có gì chúng ta có xử lý bởi vì kiểu gì cũng sẽ có vấn đề và cần có một phần của người đệm để xử lý ở đây 
parallelism là một cái cơ chế làm việc mà nó sẽ giúp chúng ta tạo ra những cái phương án xử lý khi mà có vấn đề xảy ra với mỗi các cái mối nguy hiểm của chúng ta lưu ý nó sẽ giúp chúng ta biết là cái table cái dữ liệu nào cần được chọn tốt cái nào tốt nhất nên nên chọn cái nào tốt nhất và nên bỏ cái nào à, thì nhưng mà có một cái lưu ý của chúng ta phải lưu ý ở đây là cơ chế parallelism thì nó thường nếu mắc đích là nó sẽ chỉ chọn những cái uh, bản dữ liệu nhỏ mà không đáng kể không chiếm nhiều tài nguyên của nhớ để nó tạo ra những cái parallel để nó đưa ra các cái plan execution cái plan xử lý của nó và thực ra như thế thì chúng ta không cần lọc bởi vì cái mà nó nhỏ nó không chiếm nhiều tài nguyên thì không cần chúng ta phải xử lý chúng ta cần xử lý lên những cái mà nó gây ảnh hưởng đến hệ thống và bảo tài nguyên nhiều cho nên chúng, đấy là lý do mà chúng ta nên xét cái nên đặt cái giá trị parallelism lên từ 20 năm mươi bởi vì đó là cái tầm cái range của những cái uh, lượng table mà nó đã khá lớn và nó có thể có ảnh hưởng đến hệ thống bởi vì nó đòi hỏi khá nhiều dữ liệu à đòi hỏi khá nhiều tài nguyên hệ thống để xử lý thì những cái đấy mới là những cái chúng ta nên có bách áp để chỉ ghi cho vấn đề chúng ta xử lý Okay. Uh, now the transactional log. Uh, the transactional log is basically an integrated part of your database, along with the data log, with the extension MDF, and the transactional log LDF is going to compose basically your database. Now the transactional log, what happens with it? Basically, it records all of the transactions done in your database. You should not think of transactions just like having a batch of statements, begin transaction, commit, rollback. It's not just that. Every modification done on your database is going to be a transaction. Modifications on data, uh, updates, delete, insert, or modifications on the objects on your database, create, table, drop, alter, rebuild index, everything is a transaction. Basically, in the transactional log, all of those information are written there. Again, at every checkpoint, information are going to be committed to the disk, to the database. And in that moment, the information will become, become uh, consistent. But until then, it's going to be kept in the transactional log. Why is that? So that in a case of a disaster situation, you would be able to recover everything, all of the modifications done, but not yet committed to the database. So uh, the transactional log is basically composed of virtual log. Let's say, for the um, as a theoretical example, you've got ten virtual files when you first set up your SQL. You start doing some operations, the virtual files become written, you do not achieve another checkpoint, you continue doing your operations, the virtual files will keep adding up. You will add more virtual files. Every time a virtual file is written and uh, full, it's going to have the status 2. At this moment, new virtual log files are going to be added, which means it, the, the, the transactional log file is going to grow a whole lot, and then you reach the checkpoint. When you reach the checkpoint, all of the information are going to be committed into the database, but the virtual log files, you already reached the number of 50, let's say, are going to stay there. They're going to stay there. In this moment, you would have to, of course, do a shrink in order to um, free the memory. Okay, but this is a very theoretical case because shrink almost every time you should not do shrink the database because um, I'm going to give you an exact example of a situation that I went through with one of my systems. Basically, we had a lot of problems with the memory. And a lot of exceptions, you cannot run this because the transactional log is full. So we started doing shrinking. Shrink the transactional log. Um, just small parenthesis here. 
you cannot shrink a transaction log if you have VLFs with the status 2. That means that the information has not been yet committed to the database, so the transaction log will not shrink. You would first have to do a transaction log backup and then shrink. Small parenthesis. Okay, um, and back to my example, we had a situation where we kept shrinking the log file. Of course, nothing happened because the system and the business required, the business flow for the system required the operations done daily to write into the transactional log. Basically, we had a lot of, uh, as I, I told you, I worked on. Um, on an application for processing images where all the development was done from the database. So we had a lot of operations, which means it's absolutely normal for everything to be written in the transactional log, even if you do the transactional log backup, even if data is afterwards committed to the, the database. But it's normal for the transactional log to have a certain value, bigger than two megabytes. So uh, what we did, we basically set up a job that would check every day. It would be like um, the transactional log started around 200 gigabytes. We would shrink it every day till 10 gigabytes. And then the next day before shrinking it again, record the value into a table. So we would see exactly how much is growing during the day. Because like that, if you, we would give the extra resource for the transactional log, we would not have the situation of adding the um, extra workload with shrinking, with shrinking it every time, with doing, uh, having issues with the queries done. So we basically found out that the ideal, that what the transactional log in our case required was around 170 gigabytes. The, that was the amount of uh, size that the transactional log needed in order to perform all of the daily operations and to perform them well. So just shrinking it, it, had no, it, it, had a, it wasn't something that would help us in any way because it was still growing. It just needed that space. Okay. Uh, phần này thì mình không có có cái cũ để ra ngoài thì mình sẽ dùng cái phần mà mình vẫn đang nói luôn. Em có thể hỏi, em có thể hỏi lại để tắt lại những cái ý chính không? Có thể. Chúng ta có một ví dụ về transactional log, tức là khi mà đã cảm thấy là không có đủ memory nữa thì chúng ta bắt đầu shrink tức là một đồng dữ liệu này nhưng mà đây nó chỉ là một việc mà hoàn toàn nó bị logic hoặc tính uh, lý thuyết thôi chứ không nên dùng cái quốc tế bởi vì là nếu mà chúng ta xử lý việc đấy thì chúng ta phải có một cái lưu ý là khi mà file nó đã không à, dữ liệu nó không được commit vào trong bộ nhớ rồi thì chúng ta không thể nào shrink được nó buộc là phải khi nó đã lưu đã commit vào bộ nhớ rồi mới À, thì chị còn đưa ra một cái case study là chị trong trường hợp của chị là nếu mà cái uh, transactional à cái transactional log của một cái ứng dụng xử lý ngay của chị thì nó rất là lớn nó thường là khoảng 200 bit cho nên là chị tim của chị là cần một nhu cầu là phải shrink dữ liệu mỗi ngày và năm sau đấy thì sau mỗi lần shrink thì chị sẽ record kết quả lại để chúng ta xem là cái xu hướng mà mỗi lần chúng ta phải string lượng dữ liệu chúng ta bao nhiêu để từ đấy chúng ta có để điều chỉnh được cái lượng công sức và thậm chí cả tài nguyên chúng ta để xử lý chuyện dữ liệu. Thế nhưng mà càng string thì lại càng đến một vấn đề là cái transactional log nó vẫn cứ lớn bởi vì bản thân yêu cầu của cái lượng dữ liệu nó đã lớn rồi thì chuyện string nó không có tác dụng gì cả khi mà nó cứ tiếp tục lượng dữ liệu nó tiếp tục lớn lên cho nên là string không phải là giải pháp để quyết được triệt để vấn đề. Để theo mình hiểu, thì bốn lượng dữ liệu đã lớn thì không thể nào mà cứ xuyên cả dữ liệu là phải giải quyết được. Ok. Không biết là giải thích như thế thì là có thiếu ý là có cái gì của mọi người để hiểu được không nhỉ? Ok. 
Con đó theo thầy hiểu rồi, nó mới bắt chước Yeah, sure. maybe, chắc chắn không? Maybe Đấy, không biết là có câu hỏi nào trong Mọi người nếu mà có câu hỏi nào thì hỏi luôn nhé Ở sinh mình giác suy không bẻ the transaction lock to the small of the small of the lock file Và? No, it's exactly not that, the opposite <laughs> No, so uh, the default value of the transactional lock file is going to be 2 megabytes which is really really small crazy small like you do just a select in your database and it's gonna fill it up uh, update whatever uh, you should have a job that's gonna basically each night first record the value of the transactional file then shrink it Second night, record, shrink, leave it on for like a week, two weeks, and then analyze the values. Because you will definitely see that the transactional log is going to grow each day up until a certain value. So that is the value that the transactional log should have. And then the maintenance job that's going to go like once a week, or how your business is going to be uh developed i don't know the maintenance job is gonna just check if the transactional log has reached that that uh, value that you after analyzing your setup yeah and only if it's going over that you just shrink it but you just shrink it to that value you're not shrinking to one gigabyte which is like all over the internet you will see like shrink Everybody does it to one gigabyte. The thing is, they just, it, it's just, uh, it's, not, it's not a best practice. It's just something that everybody writes in order to show you the syntax, probably. Because based on system requirements, it should not be shrinked up to one gigabyte. That's, again, low on a normal production database. So, saying in that we uh, maintenance of uh, Fox uh, system to uh, try to uh, try to uh, commit data from the uh, transaction to the real list. When you do a shrink, yes, you do not force the database to commit, but you do a transactional log backup. You do a transactional log backup to save the data that has not been yet committed into a backup, and then it's gonna be committed by default. But in order to shrink, you need to do a transactional log backup. So you would commit the data there on some place. Because otherwise, it's not going to shrink. It's going to see that you've got BLFs with the ID status of 2. It's not going to shrink. They are busy. You cannot just delete information just like that. About another one. When I set up uh, the transaction plan and simple, that is happened. With the transaction, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I set up a plan for a backup and simple. I don't know. Simple, 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 simple mode. mode. Simple so uh, that is happened to uh, just set up. I don't understand. Simple plan meaning what? I simple mode, the transaction is lost. Simple mode or not? He means that uh, he. He configs the transaction log in simple mode. In simple, in simple mode. mode. Yes. When I create a new database, when I create a new database, I choose the mode for transaction log as simple. And we have some options on. Uh, ah, like simple user mode. Yes. Ah, I have no idea. I never worked. I mean, I just changed to. Complete. single user mode when I'm doing administration stuff and then only I have access to the database nobody can change stuff but with simple mode simple that's it okay I don't know I have no idea yeah. what you could do with it sometimes uh, when uh, I need uh, to uh, set my memory this uh, this concerns so much of, uh, of uh, this so much of this I don't know exactly how much permissions you've got if you're in simple mode so I cannot tell you anything about it because I don't know what permissions you would have, what you could do. I have 
person to create an anomaly just so that that way for for protecting or that it's not uh, important that way. So as I see, uh, if I choose a simple simple plan, simple mode, it's uh, not consume so much of memory. Yeah, I understand. So you don't know if you could configure that. Yes, and uh, what uh, happened if I choose it uh, and it. Uh, uh, the thing is, like, no matter what mode you're working on, the SQL should be configured in the exact same way based on the, the business requirements. It has nothing to do with the mode that you're working on. The mode that you're working on on SQL, it just has, it has to do with the security and with the permissions given to every user that you're gonna, you're gonna have, that's, that's gonna have access to your database. But the, the SQL should be configured no matter what mode you run in. It should be configured based on the business requirement. If you've got like uh, just, I don't know, uh, test, test environment, okay, maybe you won't configure it or you will configure it if you want to see how your production is going to look like. Depending on the way you're going to do with it, basically. But it has nothing to do actually with the mold. Like the mold is, it's more about security and how, who you're going to let do whatever. Okay. Okay? okay. We'll move on? Yes? Okay. So, incapacity planning. Here I get a note. Also, I found a really cute example for random EO and sequential EO. I'm not exactly sure if you know what those are. It's basically how the data is read from the disk, the seek time and the uh, the, the the rotational latency. And I found a very nice example online with uh, ordering sushi. You know, there's the places where you can get sushi that go round on a belt, okay? So, um, in thinking you've got like uh, four kinds of plates on the belt. Each plate is going to come every minute. So, let's say you want sashimi. Sashimi might be right here, right now, or you might have, to, or he, it just passed, so you might have to wait another four minutes, right? Okay, this is random EO. Sequential EO is more like actually ordering those plates and having the waiter deliver it to you every minute. So like that you know that you're going to get the sashimi because you ordered it last after four minutes. So basically, uh, for capacity planning, you must um, understand how the workload is going to be sent to your SQL server and try to separate the data, uh, the physical data uh, file from the transactional log file. Separate them, put them on different disks if possible. Like this, the data access will be easier. Like you read from certain files, you write on another server the transactional log, and then in the background, the transactional log is going to write by itself. It's going to be not as much as a big work, not as much as a very big workload on SQL if you have everything on the same server, and then you've got like big CPU uh, time used and everything. Okay, uh, the database auto growth is the exact same thing as with the transactional auto growth. Basically, the database is just has it is the transactional logs, of course. So, database auto growth is definitely going to be set up uh, set on default auto growth. The database is going to grow by itself when it needs to, if it has, a, if it has a, a, enough space. Now, you should leave this on as a fail-safe situation, but always monitor it. 
So if your database is going to grow, it's going to grow because there's an issue. There's an issue reading the data. There's an issue on your design, the database. There are files that are growing that might not be OK with growing. So always monitor it and always check that. Sorry about the index and partitioning, how you can tell it about how SQL server. Yeah, I'm going to be talking about, I didn't, I didn't say anything now, because I'm going to be talking about indexes in the, exact, in the next slide. With data partitioning, um, what I can tell you about data partitioning is just that if you've got like a big, big table, try it. I had a situation with a big, uh, with a big table that was used for a search that was done from the database. We had, at that point, I think we had around 900 million rows in 64 columns. We denormalized it. We're going to be talking about denormalization also in order to have um, higher performance. And we partitioned it, we partitioned the table based on the data. It was um, based on each day there would be data modification. So based on that, we partitioned it. We had a little bit of um, improvement in performance, but in the end we moved to solar. The, the, the um, search engine because it was just it was too much of a workload for an SQL for that amount of data data it was just that amount of data at that point now we have a whole lot more so for future developments it wasn't okay we still keep the table in the database but we are doing a solar index and we are indexing that each day and so the search is done on that of course, every time, absolutely every time, if you've done everything, checked everything, memory is okay, you don't have enough resources to move to, I don't know why, like 300 servers, <laughs> try moving to NoSQL or try moving just parts of it. We at this point have uh, MongoDB and Cassandra both no SQLs integrated into into our into some of our projects, even though the main databases are still relational. We create indexes there also in order to improve performance on the queries because it's too much of a workload and it's way too expensive to add extra resources, hardware resources. Okay, but data partitioning doesn't necessarily just mean uh, table partitioning and object partitioning in that way. Data partitioning also means put everything on separate disks, put everything on separate file groups. Do not put everything on the exact same place because it's going to be really hard to parallelize, it's going to be really hard to access, it's going to require a whole lot of CPU time. Okay. So now for the maintenance and monitoring uh, situation. Uh, I don't know if somebody knows about this. No. No? Okay, this is the best tool ever. And it's free. It's, and it's being developed constantly. It's basically a set of scripts created by this guy that will give you so much flexibility in creating your own maintenance solution for your business requirements. It's really, really good. Uh, this contains everything, the maintenance solution uh, contains everything, rebuilding, re uh, reorganizing indexes, the statistics, backup recovery strategies, everything, basically. So definitely search it just by just exactly as it is, without any modifications. You could just set it up on any any any, um, any environment. But then, of course, watch it closely. 
because it depends how much availab uh, availability you need to have in your environment, when you can do maintenance jobs and everything. But please, please create a maintenance solution on your environment. Otherwise, it's going to be hell when disaster occurs. Okay, so first, indexes. Um, Everybody knows what indexes are? Ở đây mọi người hoàn toàn quen với những indexes, không chứ? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good, so indexes, <coughs> based on the workload, indexes are very good, perfect to use in a situation where you have to retrieve data. If you've got the work, if the workload is more about writing data, modifying data, or everything, your indexes are going to get fragmented. Which means indexes are like balanced trees. Everything is written on certain pages. When you've got a new uh, a modification on a certain line, it's a delete, update, whatever. Uh, it's gonna try to write on that on a certain page. If it, it doesn't have enough space, it's just gonna cut. Basically, if it has to, if the page is like this, it has to insert here. Uh, the page is full, it's just gonna cut, basically, the page, create a new page with all of this information and put everything here. Which means, after a bunch of modifications like this, you will end up with a lot of pages that are like half full, 20% full, 10% full, which means that at this point, indexes won't be, will actually hurt your performance in retrieving data. At that point, you have to create a way of dealing with fragmentations. Based on your system requirement, create a job that is going to check every time the indexes on the whole database. If the, the fragmentation is kind of low, reorganize, if not, rebuild. With rebuild, careful not do it in production environments. If you're going to do it in production environments, just better to delete the index and then recreate it because either way the index is not going to be available if you're doing a rebuild. You could do a rebuild online which will keep the index available but that might actually crash your whole system if it's big enough the index. Depending on requirements, better to have a maintenance solution set up and not have to deal with indexes on a real time production environment and then kill your whole system. Okay, now, uh, statistics. Everybody knows what statistics are in the database? No, okay. Um, statistics are basically created by SQL Server to have some sort of... Uh, yeah, they're about the distribution of values in the columns. So basically, SQL Server is going to create a histogram. It's going to tell you, okay, so in those columns, you have values, like integral values, starting from 1 to 200. And you've got this amount of values. So like this, the optimizer will know exactly where to do the search. Now, statistics are automatically created when you create an index. And they are also created um, on search columns even if you don't have an index on it. Um, the default SQL Server installation configuration is to auto-create statistics and auto-update statistics. Which means if you do a lot of data modification, of course, that histogram is not going to be it's not going to be the same, so you will need to update it. Otherwise, you're going to hurt performance again because SQL Optimizer is going to go search into a certain uh, range of values and because you made a whole lot of modification, he won't be able to retrieve any row there and so he's going to do an extra step in order to retrieve it. Now, all of these st statistics, uh, so that definitely means that you would have to update the statistics. Now, uh, the thing with all of these statistics, uh, Auto update is going to work when you've reached 500 rows 
in a table. It's going to trigger the auto update or if the table has reached 500 rows plus 20% from the total rows. Okay? So, auto update, of course, works fine for small tables. But if you reach a level of, as I gave you the example before, 900 billion rows, creating uh, auto update is going to happen like 20% from 900 billion. I don't know how much it, that is, but it's big. So it's going to happen just after a few months, maybe depending on how much notification I've got on my data, which is not okay, because that's gonna hurt my performance because I, maybe I'm always inserting like a million rows each day. And I'm gonna reach that value, 20% of 900 billion rows, and I'm gonna reach that in a lot of time, but in the same time, I am doing notification on my data, so data retrieval is gonna be harder if I have bad statistics. It might be even easier to not have statistics at all. But you could add them in your maintenance solution, check if your statistics are not okay. You can do that, I mean here you can use this maintenance solution or just basically check how much, you can see in the, um, you can see the statistics here and on each table you can see the statistics and you can see how many rows were taken into account last time the statistics were created or updated. So if it's gonna be a lower number by a whole lot more, a whole lot more than your actual row count, then update the statistics even though the SQL is not doing it. Uh, you can probably translate because then I'm going to get into backups and that's a little bit more again. If it needed, translation. Okay. Uh, can you help remove the value of statistics and uh, method and solution? Do okay. what? Um, can you help any demo about this? Um, the demo that I've got is on my... Person? Yeah, on my servers and it's kind of hard to show you, but I'm, I'm using basically Ola Grant's solution, but modified. Yeah. Modified because um, I have different production environments. I've got a production environment that has to be available basically 24-7. I've got a production environment that is um, just administration, so I've got enough time to do everything. I've got different situations, so based on that I modified this to suit my needs. And also I modified this for the statistics to, I mean the statistics are actually there's a whole lot more to talk about with the statistics. Um, you could do the, the update of the statistics to just take a certain amount of values from your, from your table or percentage or an actual amount of values. Or you can take, um, <clears throat> you can take just a few columns. You can update just a few columns. So, um, what I modified here and how I modified it was um, creating everything basically based on my needs because it took a lot of time to actually recreate the whole statistics again because I have big tables and not a lot of time to keep the server occupied with the maintenance solution and so I I don't know, I found a way of not actually having the statistics all the time perfect in a perfect state because most likely you're not going to be able to do that if you're in a production development uh, environment. You're not going to be able to keep everything working perfectly every time because that's going to require maintenance time, which we won't have if you need it to be available. But basically how this looks is just a bunch of scripts, bunch of scripts with the uh, parameters, uh, store procedures basically with parameters, 
that you can um, set up in order to tell them what to do. And then your job, they like on uh, SQL Server Agent, create a job and just when you've got enough time, execute the maintenance solution. Another thing that I've done, because I don't have a lot of maintenance time, after each, I've separated actually everything. I've separated the indexes, statistics, and the backup strategy. I've separated them into three different jobs. And um, every time, I also have another job that's going to check if the for example, it's going to check if the indexes have finished before 8 a.m. when I know that people are going to, the, 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 the application is going to be very hard to uh, query. Uh, if it's not finished, if the indexes are not finished, it's going to stop automatically the job, yes. And the second day, it's not because it's, it's running daily for me. And the second day is going to check which are the indexes that have already been rebuilt and try to rebuild the other ones with bigger issues that the, the job from the previous night was unable to do. Ah, another important thing, always run the statistics after the indexes maintenance because um, if you do a rebuild on an index, it's going to automatically update the statistics. So if you do the statistics before, you're just going to do extra work for nothing. Because <laughs> it's going to do the rebuild either way and then re-update re the, the statistics. Okay. So, uh, I hope I didn't break it. No. Okay, so um, I'm gonna be fixing this afterwards. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. It's just it's just out, but I'm gonna fix it afterwards. Okay. Uh
uh, recovery, and you already know exactly where are the data, where are the back backups that you need to use, which are the backups that you need to do. This is when you already have a strategy already implemented, the script already implemented and just run. That's when it's going to take six hours if the backups took six hours. So, of course, you will not be compliant with, compliant with your demands. It's going to take six hours. It's not okay. Now, the thing is, here you've got basically three options. You can tune a little bit your backups, try to make them go faster. You can, uh, yeah. you can pull less data on servers, you can start implementing a failover situation or a high availability situation, but here again, money. Uh, I wanted to show you there's actually a really cool, I don't know if some of you know about Brent Ozar. Brent Ozar? Okay. I don't know if you know about him, but he's cool. You should read his posts. <laughs> Good. Okay, so basically, for different situations where you will need high availability, where you will need disaster recovery strategies, or just like human error, you should basically talk with your client, with your boss, whoever is in charge of the business of your application, to be able to set up exactly what's happening. And first, your job as a DBA or a DBA dev, it would be to uh, fill up this column, okay? So, if something bad happens, you should know how much time your recovery is gonna take. If you know how much time your recovery is gonna take, you will know, okay, I did uh, on a test uh, test environment. I tried to, to to do the recoveries after the backups. It took me one hour, right? So it's, you already done that. You know how much it takes. And then your IT goal would be, and the big goal for the client would be, okay? And based on how much time the is the acceptable downtime, you can see how much data would be lost in that amount of time. Now, with zero every time as the goal means that you would have to set up everything. Disaster recovery, high availability, which means a lot of servers, a lot of manpower. You would need a DBA definitely to be working on those high availability situations and failover clusters, everything. That means money, right? A lot of money. Um, also, always create the recovery strategy first and then the backups afterwards when you create the backup solution. So basically, first thing to do is set the RPO, set the RTO to be compliant with your business requirement needs and with your client's needs. Then create the recovery strategy, how much time it's going to take me to actually be compliant with these two values. And from the recovery strategy, you just work towards the backups. Okay? Um, Translation needed? I'm going to 